I'm here with Dr. Mark Rothenberg, some research questions this time. Uh, the first one's about palpate. So it was hypothesized that eosinophil esophagitis might be a, a kind of calpinopathy. Excuse me. But what more is known about the role of calpane 14 in eosinophilic esophagitis today than two years ago? Is it likely that a calpane inhibitor, particularly one already in existence, may be of use in the future? If so, how will that connect with other pathways or proteins that have been showing significance in via research like Sphinx 7? Yes, so uh, discovery that calpane 14 was a uh, primary um, event in EOE um, was um, really uh, surprising. And uh, at the time, there wasn't anything published or known about calpane 14, and certainly its association with EOE was, was completely, um, you know, uh, it was completely um, based on an empirical analysis of the genome. So uh, when we first uh, found this, there were no reagents uh, for studying calpane 14, and we've taken the last couple of years to build a framework to begin to ask questions. That includes the uh, ability to make the protein, the um, ability to study the gene, uh, its regulation, and all these areas have now been, um, have now been uh, developed. Uh, and we have tools on our hand to, to um, improve um, and, and, and advance the understanding. We basically now know, uh, particularly, you know, it's a little more technical, is that, that, that EOE um, can be um, linked and associated genetically with uh, variants in the calpane 14 gene. Calpane 14 is an eosinophil, um, is, is an esophageal specific protein. It's one of the uh, strongest proteins that shows selectivity for the esophagus, and it's that selectivity for the esophagus that explains the susceptibility for the esophagitis not the general atopy or allergies that we see in these patients. We do know, which is an amazing uh, connection here, is that the adaptive immune system, the, the allergic response, induces calpane 14. So the protein in the gene is very low levels, it is high it's in the esophagus than anywhere else in the body, but when you have an allergic reaction, particularly the R13, induces the, the calpane 14 by a thousand fold, um, which is you know, a huge change. And this then leads to a change in the function of the epithelial cells that are normally part of the barrier. And uh, we're heavily working on understanding uh, as an enzyme, calpane 14 is an enzyme, what is the enzyme substrate? What does it normally bind to? And what does it do? And uh, we now have leads that it's um, involved in, in a whole uh, specific pathway that has to do with epithelial cell biology. And, um, and uh, we're heavily pursuing that. Now, uh, in terms of calpane um, inhibitors, that's something that, that do, they do exist, and we are working on, on developing re reagents that specifically target calpane 14, um, both increase its activity and suppress its activity. And uh, we hope that we can uh, manipulate um, esophagitis and the repair response in the epithelium by regulating it with these uh, chemical agents that may be also ultimately therapeutic um, you know, material. How this relates to Sphinx 7 is um, that both of these are, are clearly involved in epithelial cell biology. They're both in, involved in barrier um, function, normal uh, mucosal barrier in the squamous epithelium, particularly the esophagus. And, um, and uh, they actually are pathways that are they're regulating the same thing, but they actually are independently regulating it. So they're two points of, um, of a barrier uh, maintenance and, and repair, two separate uh, pathways. And, um, and we are actively pursuing their connection. And it'll be very interesting to see um, how um, you know, they interact more. Sphinx 7 is, a, is an enzyme inhibitor. Help 14 is an enzyme. Uh, we need to understand how these uh, proteolytic pathways uh, talk to each other. Speaking of barriers, this next question is about the microbiome. So how close are we to understanding the role of microbiota, especially in infancy, in skewing towards Th2 diseases? Is the esophageal, esophageal microbiome any differently understood in terms of commensal versus pathogenic microbial signatures than the gut microbiome is? Are there studies in process to look at whether the significant microbial variances are causal or consequential of disease? And are we many years out from clinical interventions? The microbiome is an area of active and exciting research. We know that the esophagus has its own unique microbiome. 
the bacteria in the esophagus is uh, present in normal homeostatic conditions. It is much lower than the uh, lower GI tract in the, in the colon, for example. Um, and that there are uh, changes in the microbiome in patients with the disease, uh, a process called dysbiosis. And uh, the best way to prove that this is uh, causative of the disease is to actually look at uh, uh, experimental systems in mice. And we are collaborating uh, with investigators that have a germ-free colony of mice, for example. And we can uh, take the bacteria for both the stool and the colon and also the esophagus and putting them back into the uh, germ-free condition. It turns out the germ-free mice have an increased dis uh, predisposition to allergies. They have increased IgE. And then when you put bacteria in, you can put it in for patients with, without different types of diseases, in this case, food allergy. Food allergy bacteria will promote the uh, food allergy in uh, mice. And uh, what we need to do is show that this is also operational in EOE, and that's where we are right now.